Uh, my video does that my video doesn't seem to be working. Oh yeah, we can't see nope. you. Um let's see. So oh, oh there we go. Your video we, you. we just see a we big blur. <laughs> yeah. Something's not working right. I see your background and I see a blur in the middle. I wonder, is there something in the way of your um, camera, little camera up there? No, there isn't. I don't know what's wrong here. I did replace all my sound system yesterday. Uh, yeah, I don't think I've ever seen that before. There is something wrong here. Hang on. Okay. Well, we got plenty of time to figure it out. Yeah, I'm glad we came early so we could get organized. Yeah, definitely. Helps a lot. I mean, you can blur your background, but it doesn't look like his whole background was blurred. Hmm. Can you hear me now? Mm -hmm. we, we can hear you well. Okay, well, you're not going to see me. Okay. I don't know what's wrong. I just did like I've always done with you and I can't. And my, uh, my camera is not working. Um, um, sorry. If you click the up arrow on where it says stop video, it will take you into your video settings. And is there anything in there that might help? Um, which camera it's using? There's only one camera. Hmm. Not sure There's what's only going one on. camera. And it's what, what you're not getting is you're not getting me. You're getting my background, but not me. Normally, when I plug in my camera, the light comes on. And right now, when I plug it in, the light's not on. So you're just going to have me this way. Well, we'll listen to you. <laughs> We're still so grateful you're here. Yeah. Tab really wanted to make it, but. Wasn't a good time. Well, maybe we can do another one if you guys want to. That would be awesome. awesome. It's such a. It's such a. There's probably a lot of people that couldn't come to this. We could call it part two. I posted a video in the book club today. I, I just randomly found someone who did a review of the book and he, he already said, oh, I can't wait till the second version comes out of this. <laughs> Pretty exhausted from doing the first one. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, that's what I thought. I said, he just finished this one. <laughs> yeah. We need a little vacation before yeah, we dive into anything else. Before yeah. I start needing another version <laughs> oh so we got five minutes i sent everyone i think let me look i think i try to send personally everyone that was on the earth well i'm also going to make you a co-host but you've got a little control over things too uh jasmine's here she runs the titanic era music on Instagram. Oh, okay. Yeah. Jasmine Bedford. Aware of her feed. Hello, Jasmine. Welcome. Hi, Jasmine. We're so glad you're here. Hello. That, that, the Silish, how do you say his name? He said he was coming. Uh, I believe, and again, you can throw me under the bus, but I believe it's <laughs> Vasily Ristovic. But um, if if I've steered you wrong on that, just <laughs> blame me. That's well, it's, it's really neat to see, you know, when I was looking through the book, it, you know, all the different countries everyone's from. Yeah, it's amazing. Uh, truly an international effort. Yeah, and Titanic isn't just an international, you know, people can't believe how many people all over the world 
study Titanic history and they're like, what? I know, I know. And Elang said he was coming. Am I saying that right? Elang? That one I'm not quite as sure on. Um, I thought it was Elang Erlanga, but I okay. might I might be wrong. Yeah, well, if he, when he arrives, we can ask him. And Alejandre, he said he was coming. Alejandre. And the, who's I going with? Hopefully they're, hopefully that everybody saw my message. Let me get in. Jasmine, where are you coming from again? I forgot. Oh, I'm, I'm coming from Wales. Wales, right. Oh, okay. I just let a Peter in. Ta -da. Oh, well, we can see you. Yay. Hey, nice. Oh, that's wonderful. So what was it, Bill? Well, what it was, was when I was jimmying around with all my uh, speakers yesterday, I had to unplug a lot of stuff and plug things in and blah, blah, blah. Um, what it was is I slid this, uh, the slide over the camera. <laughs> that was all it was. Oh. <laughs> I wondered if something was in front of your camera. But... Well, I was that, you know, normally I don't play with that slide, but when I was fooling around and moving the, the uh, monitor around, um, I must have hit it. Oh, we're glad you got it working. Yeah. It's good to see you. Every one of the clocks in my house says something different. 4.03. So I thought I could just welcome everyone and then turn it over to you guys. Who wants to go first, Bill or Kent? <laughs> Or me. You want me? You want me to? Uh, yeah, I want you to go first. You want me to go first? You're better, far better at this intro stuff than I am. I don't have to dance, do I? I don't want to dance. I really don't want to dance. <laughs> Hello, David. How are you? Hi, Marcel. Hi, Peter. Terry. Oh, hello. Here comes Terry. I have this. Oh, David's here. Yay. Very nice to have you with us, David. Ah, so nice to have, have everyone here. Hi, Jasmine. She's better. There's a reason Aww, I have to wear my glasses when I'm on screen. I can't see the screen very well otherwise. Yeah. Yeah, me either. I just have to have my glasses nearby. <laughs> Hi. Hi, Terry. Sorry, I'm a bit of a mess today. Hi, Terry. Hi. Oh, hi, Bill. How you doing? Good to see you. It's fine. Ah, uh, that's you. You're up. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, good. Hi, Kent. Oh, we got hey, awesome. how are you? Good. How you doing? Good. Oh, let good me to have you with us. So we'll give everybody a couple minutes. Since it's just, I think it's just four. What does everyone's clock say besides mine? Hello, everyone. Hi, David. Hey, I'm so glad you could come. Hi, David. Yay! Great to have you with us. <laughs> it's awesome. We're doing Thank you for having us. Doing this on the anniversary of the Empress of Ireland. <laughs> what a coincidence. I don't know if anybody realized that. And you had to mention an anniversary, and I just feel, and now you just reminded me that 
the anniversary of my first marriage was a day or so ago. Oh, sorry. Many years ago. Sorry. I'll live. <laughs> and she went down in 14 minutes. That's crazy. Oh, Michael Standard, he indicated came. He wasn't sure if he could come. Oh, we've got a nice group here. If you guys are shy about using this, you can use the chat feature on the bottom. Which I don't see the chat feature. I don't see it either. I'm here. Hi, hey, Michael. Michael. Glad you could come. Yeah, I don't know why my picture's not showing up. See yeah, we just, we, we, just, we just went through this with um, Bill, but he, is your camera turned on? It should be. That's why we can't see it. There, there you go. We go. Oh, God Yay. help us all. Oh, this yes, is great. Is, this I is have what Buzzard looks like with his hair down, literally. <laughs> <laughs> you want well, my book left You can have it. Oh, I'm here. Hi, Mary. Hi, Mary. Oh, you want my hi. Left arm? Uh, Bill, how about it? you want my broken left arm, Kent? You want it? You don't want it. Oh, no, that's okay. I'll give it to Jill. <laughs> no, I don't want it either. Well, I do could use an extra arm. Sure. I had a broken use a brand leg new one body. six months. I don't want to do that again. <laughs> no, I broke a wrist. I, I definitely don't want any more broken bones. <laughs> I have well, a broken right toe and I didn't really, I didn't know it, but you know, not fun. I was working the overhead at work, getting some stuff down, trying to get everything ready for inventory, which is coming up. And I thought I was stepping on the floor. I instead, I was missing a step. Oh! Yeah, it was oh. me versus the concrete floor and the metal upright, the concrete and the metal upright one. Oh, ouch. I already hear that, Michael. Uh, oh, hi, Mary. Well, Bill should know where I work. It's the, it's the uh, Home Depot over in Easley. It's right along 123. He lives in Greenville now. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, about what, 15 miles away, I'd guess? Yeah. It's 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 in that same area where that battery's plus and the jack in the box. Uh, we don't go to, we don't go to Easley a whole lot. So I'm not, but I know I bought my car there years ago. Okay. Well, if you're ever, if you, you know, if you ever need some some plumbing and you're in town, whenever I'm working there, I'm working opening team. <laughs> okay. If I'm there, I'm full time, but I'm on a random schedule. I'm full time retired. Oh, okay. <laughs> Are you really oh. retired when you're so busy? <laughs> oh. You still. Oh, well, maybe I'll introduce everybody. So my name is Jill Carlier, and I am with the Titanic Book Club, as you know, and we are all gathered together to discuss the book of the month, which everyone has been highly anticipating and really excited about. And this meeting is just made even more fantastic because we have authors Bill Wormstead here and Jay Kent Layton. Um, Chad Fitch, unfortunately, could not come, but perhaps oh. we can schedule another meeting so that we can have him. Uh, also, I'm very excited to say that, you know, as you know, there's several authors or um, artists in this book. I'll hold it up here. 17 of them. <laughs> <laughs> Am I said about right, Kent? 17? That sounds about right. Some of the various characters, too. That's <laughs> so exciting. Well, Tatiana recently. What's that? Tatiana, has anyone heard from her recently? I'm concerned about her. Uh, uh, Tad heard from her a couple of weeks ago, Kent, was it? Somewhere along there, yeah. Yeah, yeah. and both her and um, who was the other one in St. Petersburg? Uh, um, Jenya. Jenya. And they were both doing okay. Um, we're kind of bothered because we can't get a book to them. Well, they've cut things off. She said they cut off PayPal, so she, they're having trouble getting paid there. They've cut off lots of their oh, social media. Yeah. We, we did get PDF copies of the books to both of them, but we can't get the real book. Oh. Well, my they cut off the post office too? The yeah, post, there's no, the there's no way of getting anything into the country. Oh. 
Sad. Well, my big concern is that games to get everything to Australia. Or I should say, Kent had to play a lot of silly little games to get the stuff to Australia. Yeah, that was quite a headache. The Australian Post and the USPS have not been uh, the best of friends over the last year or so. And um, that was awful. But fortunately, our Australian customers were extremely patient with us. And now they have their copies and they seem to be very happy. So mm -hmm. I liked it. Wow. My concern about Tatiana, and the, well, I mean, they, they were critical of the campaign. And, you know, old Uncle Vlad is a former KGB field spook. And you know how those guys think. Oh. Too kind of opposition. So I'm worried. We'll keep them in our Make thoughts. Make sure to stay in contact with them. Yeah. Um, you know, I see Jenya on Discord. He's on the Discord chat um, for the Ocean Gate. I don't know if anyone's okay. on that. But he seems to be able to get in over there. So if anyone wants to talk with him here. I haven't seen Tatiana over there. She was, she was talking for a while, but she went quiet. Very quiet, yeah. Yes, and we have some of those authors right here in this in this chat. We've got David. Now, David, tell me how to say your last name. I always say aloe vera. Is it pronounced properly? Oh, he can't. I don't think his um, video audio is working. Oh. Yes, it's working. Hi, everybody. My name is David Oliveira. Um, <laughs> I'm one of the artists, and it's wonderful to have you all here. It's great. Thank you, Jill and Tad and Jay and Bill for for having all of us. So it's and all of you, you know, for you know the support. So I'm so very, glad very, very cool. And we've also got another one of the artists, um, Cyril Codis. I'm not sure if I said that right. Um, he and his brother Lionel. Mm -hmm. Um, I remember seeing a lot of their line drawings on uh, Encyclopedia Titanica. Excellent work. Yes, it is. Beautiful. Yeah. We go back to the days of the Titanic Research and Modeling Association, the message board over there. I've yeah. known both of them since all those years ago. So it's good to have you with us. Well, yeah, and they went belly up. You're just that was a fabulous resource there. Lots of great articles, information. Something a beautiful like resource. Techies, yeah. yeah. Something like techies like me get our teeth into. Mm -hmm. And Jill, um, a couple of the people are messaging on Instagram say the chat doesn't appear to be available. Yeah, it doesn't look like the chat is working today. I don't believe it's activated on this meeting. Yeah. All right, I'm going to turn this over to Tad. Tad, why don't you tell everyone about yourself and um, and why you guys decided to put out this amazing book that makes us all so happy. Well, um, my name is Kent Layton. Um, forget the first initial, you can all call me Kent. Um, a lot of you know our older work on A Sea of Glass that was released back in 2012 uh, that Tad and Bill and I wrote together. Um, and we were struck with the idea that, that um, Honesty of Glass is a very long book. It has over 300,000 words in it. Uh, it actually is beginning to encroach on war and peace territory um, and has a lot of black and white pictures and it has a color section. But we really wanted to I think boil down the story to its most basic elements in text and add in all of the refinements that we've learned over the last 10 years, the updates, uh, the things that we've learned. Um, and we wanted to uh, do something in color that would also really bring the ship back to life. Um, and uh, so we, we approached the publisher and we, we didn't have a title. We didn't have a, a working length. We didn't have anything. We just had this rough concept. And we had several 
exchanges with our editor, Amy, at the History Press. And um, we went back and forth and back and forth. And she was very intrigued by the idea, but we weren't even explaining it very well. And she just kept asking us, you know, OK, well, a little bit more, a little more, a little more detail. And um, we actually penned the introduction and sent it to her. And she said, I've got it. And uh, so now then she went to, to the board and the next thing you know, they wanted to do a, um, a full color book. This was the History Press's first full color book in this format. Um, every page is color. They've never done that before. They took a risk on it, which was um, awesome. Uh, I, was, I was blown away with that. Um, and so we very much appreciate their help, their participation. They've been great to work with. Um, and really, Bill and I, we want to hear what questions are out there about the book or why we did things. Or <laughs> um, We're very, very curious to hear your thoughts, your input, your questions. Uh, thank you so much. And I just realized I introduced you as Ted, sorry. <laughs> um bill do you have anything you want to add about well yourself? i was i was laughing when kent mentioned <laughs> we didn't even have a title we didn't have a title for a long time <laughs> um correct me if I, i'm remembering wrong kent but i i think it was kind of we went back and forth with with us and amy and we finally created the title and even then it we was had still kind of like until we come up with something better <laughs> We, we had about a dozen, was it a dozen titles that we worked through in the drafts? Could be, could be. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, we went back and forth with Amy and we finally got one that works. Um, uh, Kent and Tad were, did a lot of the work with the artists, figuring out um, what they were going to do, what they wanted to do. Um, um, people we had spotted online. And then once we pretty much started getting the book down, certain people came out of the woodwork and say, well, what about me? What about me? Well, we were full at that point. We couldn't really fit any more in. Um, and it's all great art. I mean, and the artists are, they, they kind of each have their, their own niche as to what they wanted to do. And we let them run with it. And we kind of wrote the text around it. That sound about right, Kent? Yeah, that's that's about the size of it. Um, it was uh, the idea for the book for me actually was, I'd have to say two years, maybe longer back. Uh, and I... I had the idea rattling around in the back of my head, but one of the things that we didn't have at that point was an animation of the sinking. And of course, Titanic is not just um, the story of the ship's construction, but also of the disaster. So if you're going to be doing an illustrated book, you really need to have some way of illustrating what happened during the sinking. And when we worked with uh, Tom Linsky of HFX Studios and his team, um, we did the 109th anniversary animation and we did that as a live stream and he was kind enough to get us any image from any angle that we wanted for use in this book and uh, that was a tremendous thing and I think that was the final wasn't that Bill wasn't that the final thing that we were like okay we can do the book now that we've got everything in place yeah that kind of gave us images to go along with the the text of the sinking and describing that visually because we were trying to do everything we could on a visual level um was it vasily who did all the um paintings of the ship itself the interiors or am i remembering that, wrong that was chris walker over chris in walker. England. okay yeah yep. yeah he gave us a lot of images to show the interiors of the ship um, and those help give us a, a sequence too, as we're just, there's a section in the book where we describe the ship and with images. And I think that worked out really well. 
I think one of our favorite images in the uh, in the book is actually uh, some is an original that David Oliveira did for us, um, and we had the idea because we wanted the chapter to start with feeling like you were boarding the ship in Southampton, what you would see when you went through those gangway doors. And um, Bill's the one who actually came up with the final angle on that. I uh, thought that was uh, really good work on his part. Um, and then David went to work for us and created a, a stunning moment. All of us are familiar with the Frank Brown photograph where he's boarding a ship in Southampton and looking down the side of the ship. And David actually showed us what it might have looked like uh, to capture that moment when he was about ready to snap that famous photo. So that was a, a truly awesome uh, piece to be able to include too. Yeah, thank you so much. If anyone wants to ask a question, as you can tell, our chat feature isn't working, but there on the bottom, there's this little button that says reactions and you can put your hand up like that if you want to ask a question. To raise your hand, we will we will entertain your questions. <laughs> or you can raise your physical hand like Terry's doing. Terry? Oh yeah, you can wait. Oh Terry, you can you you can all mute and unmute yourself. So go ahead, Terry. Hey, I have two questions actually. One first one is <clears throat> what made you guys decide to um oh and the book is fantastic. It, it's an amazing book. Um, what made you guys decide to uh, just, um, how did you pick, when you picked whose art was going to use, was going to be used, how do you guys decide that? And also, yeah, it's a question about the sinking, of course. Um, everyone knows that uh, many, many of these ships like quickly rolled over, the Empress of Ireland, the Andrea Doria. The fact that the Titanic pretty much went down, or do you think that was a detriment to, for the, you know how many people didn't want to get into the lifeboats at first? Do you think the fact that she didn't roll over had a bit of a lesser, you know, in the very beginning, do you think that the fact that she didn't roll over was a detriment to getting them off the, getting them into the lifeboats? You know, because they felt so secure on the ship. You understand what I'm trying to ask? Yep. I do. I do. So that's two questions. So, Bill, how many hours did we spend on Zoom <laughs> going through draft images, figuring out which ones we had, which ones we wanted, and figuring out what gaps we had where we needed more? That was a lot of time. Yeah. Yeah. There was a lot of time in there. Um <sighs> It was a lot. Yeah, yeah, a lot. Um, when you get a when you get a contract from a publisher, most of the time there is a word count limit, and there is a limit on the number of images that you can include. And so, uh, and that's because the the publisher they they're very good at figuring out how to use page space and how to make it attractive visually to a potential reader. And so they know about how many words will fit on a page or how many pictures will fit on a page. So in the contracts, we had it specified, you know, we had a, and it was a hard cap too. Um, our previous book on a sea of glass, it was a much looser cap and we ended up going way over budget on our word count. But this was, this was a firm cap and that was fair because they had to uh, put the money into the book up front. So we had um, we had a lot of exterior art that we wanted. Uh, we wanted to use David's art. We knew we wanted to use Vasily's art. I believe I'm saying that right. I hope he doesn't um, hear me mispronounce his name. Um, we had a lot of other artwork. We had uh, Jan <clears throat> Udestein, I believe is how you pronounce his name. Um, we had Cyril and Lionel. Uh, we had Michael Brady down in Australia, um, and we knew we wanted to use all of, you know, what they were making available to us. One of the things that we were short on was interior imagery, um, and I think it was Tad, 
wasn't it Bill who found a Chris uh, and found what he'd been doing? It could have been. I I think we were we were like, well, are we going to be able to do this or not? And then Tad came in and he said, wait, I found Chris Walker, and look at what he's doing. We were thrilled with um, with Chris's work. In fact, uh, we had a lot of artwork that he made available to us. Um, and when we told him what we wanted, he actually said, I have a lot of revisions that need to be made. Um, and he went in and he revised his models based on some of his more recent research so that when they finally went into publication, they would reflect uh, the latest uh, that he knew that he had available. And I know he burned a lot of midnight, midnight oil getting that ready for the deadline because we were on a hard deadline from the publisher too. And uh, we truly appreciated all his work. Yeah, and we, from the publisher, we also had a the number of images. We had to kind of fit that down. We had to go through the images and say, okay, we got three images for this thing. We can only use two of them. Which one are we not going to use? We had to, we had to get, we, we did manage to keep all the artists in the book. That's, that's number one right there. We were able to keep them all in, but there were images we flat out couldn't use. We also had to cut some of the text. I remember there was a uh, what we call a box item that I had written. And I said, let's just toss that. I wasn't happy with it anyway. And, but I said, look, let's just forget about it. And that gets us down under our, our word limit. Simple solution. That was uh, about which iceberg yeah, was the most likely lot, candidate. Yeah, as I, the more I worked on that, the more I realized this needs to be even bigger, and we didn't have the space for it. It's fodder for future releases. That'll be good. So does that answer your question, Terry? Yeah. Now okay. the second question about whether she, if she, the uh, fact that she went down you know, by the head and didn't roll over, did that, was that a detriment to getting people off that's, the ice? That's a good question. Um, for one thing, you don't want a ship rolled over on its side during a, right. an evacuation. Um, it happened with Lusitania, as you said, Empress of Ireland, it happened with Andrea Doria, and it basically, it renders about half of your lifeboats more or less obsolete, or they're going to have significant problems as they're lowering away. So we always have been astonished at comparing Titanic's behavior during the sinking, how well she behaved compared to many other ships, ships that were supposed to be even safer, like Lusitania or Mauritania, which had been built on a government subsidy. They were basically um, cruisers um, just without the armor. But you had a very delicate situation on the ship. On the one hand, because you only have enough lifeboats for half on board, roughly half on board to begin with, you don't want to instill a panic. Right. And if the ship had rolled over more severely, um, been a lot more dramatic in its motions, you might have had more people early on say, sure, I'll get off in a lifeboat. But then again, you would have run into the problems that many other ships ran into. And in fact, I strongly suspect, based on my research, that a ship like the Lusitania or the Mauritania um, would have sunk far more quickly than Titanic did. And the death toll would, it, it would still have been high and it would have been an even more horrific event than it actually ended up being. Um, I think one can only be amazed at the way Titanic um, withstood the damage initially and provided that stable platform to launch those lifeboats from. Um, even as it was, um, you know, there were gaps between the deck and the gunwales of the lifeboats. Um, the one, I think it was a French lady who fell as she was trying to board one of the later boats. Number um, 10. Yeah. So I, it's a good question, but I don't think 
Yeah, because they thought they were a lot safer because she didn't roll over. She just went. It was the tail end of it when she started to come a bit more in the state. Yeah, she she had a slate list to starboard to begin with, and then right. she she went over to port, and the port list was a little bit more dramatic, uh, especially right. uh, about 150. Um, right. And, and moving from there until she took the, the, the forward plunge that swamped the bridge. Um, and then the, the eyewitnesses were quite clear that she actually came up on an even keel uh, right. at the time that she'd take that plunge. But yeah, it's, does that help your question? Does it help answer it at all? Or is, yeah, I mean, because I, I was just, I, you know, I guess I was wondering because psychologically, the, of course they were already believed that she was unsinkable anyway. And why would they want to go into those little boats and when they have a nice warm ship right there. And then I was wondering since she hadn't, she since she didn't keel over, even keel over even more than she did, you know, I was wondering the fact that she didn't go, to, that she didn't keel over, maybe a, a, a little bit more of a keel, maybe that would have encouraged them to get in the lifeboats. You know what I'm saying? Well, the fact that yeah, she was I so think... stable that, she, as you say, she behaved well, maybe that also influenced their decision to be. Well, this ship's stable enough. Why should I go into lifeboat? You understand? You understand where I'm coming from? Yeah, I think it only helped the situation, honestly. Right. Yeah. Um, I mean, even as late as after the ship broke, right. there were still people who watched the stern falling back, who thought that it was a safety feature and the stern was going to continue. Oh, to yeah. So, I mean, the the confidence in the ship was extremely high. Um, you know. I think it helped more than anything else. What, what do you think, Bill? Is that, is that your take well, too? I, I personally think that the uh, engineers down in the lower levels, they were counter flooding like mad to keep that ship uh, it, on an even keel, trying to keep it from tipping over. I mean, I have no proof of that, but I think that's one of the things they would have logically have done. Um, but it was doomed from the start. Like right. uh, Thomas Andrews said, he said, we've got maybe an hour, hour and a half left to go. It's going to go down. Um, there just wasn't another choice. The only question was how it was going to go down. And we do know that all those engineers, not one of them survived. Right. Some of them there's, did come up, up deck, correct? Well, no. there's, there's debate about whether they came up on deck or not. Um, okay. I okay. seem to recall, and I don't have the book in front of me right now, that in Lightoller's 1930s book, he said he saw some up on top. Oh, okay. But I think early in his 1912s testimony, he said they he never saw them. So I don't know. Um, I think I you also did in hard, I haven't heard any hard proof that they came up on deck. Okay. Maybe some, but I think most of them were down inside the ship. There seems to be some confusion whether they did or not. Just as this yeah. documentary out there says that they didn't, and some people said that they did, and it just seems very confusing. Yeah, and we don't have any hard evidence one way or the other. Okay. Not that I'm aware of anyway. Historically, the black gang has always been out of sight, out of mind anyway. So I don't think, any, I'm not sure anyone would have paid that close attention to it. You had the fire, some of the firemen, stokers come up, uh, right. they got, drafted into the lifeboats as crew, but you know, if the officers get other than that, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Yeah. Visible. And those a lot of those firemen and stokers and trimmers, a lot of them were ordered up topside at 120, as I recall. A lot of them, you know, they give the same time all at 120. And that's an hour before the ship sinks, but it's also when things started getting uh, far busier. A lot of things going on at the same time. And at 120, when you're up on deck, things are starting to look bad. And I would expect those passengers are saying, I, we can't wait anymore. That's why you've got the, the, <clears throat> the aft lifeboats starting to fill up. 13, 15, 11, 10, and 12, and 16. All very full. Hopefully that helps answer yeah. your question. I'm seeing a hint from uh, Mr. Kaplan. Thank you. We, uh, yeah. You're welcome. Uh, okay. I just like to, I'm just doing this for memory, but um, I think the um, Andrea Doria uh, 
the wonderful thing about the Andrea Doria when it hit the Stockholm was that it took 14 hours before it, uh, it went down in where the Titanic was like two hours and 40 minutes and the Lusitania was almost instantaneous, uh, just uh, you know about 25 minutes or, or something. The Lusitania uh, went because it had been hit by a torpedo. And um, on the Andrea Doria, the, uh, even the captain um, could uh, leave the ship and survive uh, without any embarrassment. Uh, there was a very interesting story on the Andrea Doria. There was a passenger named Linda Morgan, and uh, they uh, told her parents that she had passed away. And uh, they later found out that when the two ships collided, that Linda Morgan had been thrown into the Stockholm and she survived. Yeah. Yes, definitely. That's crazy. She was thrown onto the bow of the Stockholm and when they were after the collision, the crewmen on the Stockholm were climbing up to the bow to see what was left, and they found this girl. Yeah. <laughs> Amazing story. Yeah, the, the the Andrea Doria lasted for quite a while. I think it had um, uh, transverse bulkheads. Kent, do you I remember did. that I one? I believe she did. Yeah, I, I think so. it's been a I while so. since I looked. Yeah, and what are those? The transfer spoke. They is they get, go from the port to the starboard side, as opposed to the longitudinal, which extend the length of the ship. Yeah, the longitudinal that I'm talking about. I think the Andrea Doria has a longitudinal. I'm saying it wrong. Um, yeah, and I don't have my Lusitanian books handy. Well, well that went because of the torpedo uh, that book. went down. Uh, but the, the good thing about the Lusitania was that the water was much warmer than it was where the Titanic was. So I think even the captain of the Lusitania managed to survive uh, yeah. in the water. Well, don't forget the second explosion. Second explosion is what I think didn't help either. Yeah, so they've Lusitania, never known what, uh, they've never figured out for sure what that was. <laughs> so yeah. they, it, what, what's amazing yeah. is I, I also have, um, done a lot of work on the Lusitania, um, researched her, I put out a book about the Lusitania, and several interesting things that I discovered, uh, one of which was they knew right from the time they designed the ship that her and Mauritania were actually quite dangerous in any flooding scenarios uh, because of those longitudinal bulkheads. In fact, her designer, her naval architect, Leonard Peskett, he advised the company that if the ship had ever assumed a list of a certain degree or greater, that she should be abandoned immediately. I think it was uh, 15 degrees. I believe that's what it was, yeah. I read your book. Yeah, <laughs> Michael's been following our work for a long time. Um, and so it was basically any scenario where the Lusitania or the Mauritania encountered uh, flooding in those coal bunkers on the sides of the ship, it was going to drag the ship over on the side, and it was basically going to ensure a catastrophe. They almost lost the Mauritania twice, and they only through the most brilliant of efforts did they manage to, to save her. Um, with regards to the second explosion, uh, we've actually, we know where the torpedo hit, and it's a, a lot further astern than where most people place the collision. Um, it was actually right about at the juncture of the first two boiler rooms um, between the first and second funnels, astern of the bridge. So we know it had nothing to do with munitions. It had nothing to do with uh, secret cargo that, um, that's that been a very popular thing. Yeah. Um, and really, when you get to that area of the ship, there's not much in the way of candidates for what could possibly cause a second explosion. And it seems most likely from all the research that we've done that the Lusitania second explosion was um, a failure of her primary steam uh, system, her steam generating plant. Whether that's a boiler explosion or whether that's a failure of the mains that carried the high pressure steam after the turbines, one or the other, um, it, it was a dramatic effect. Um, but the interesting thing is Lusitania, because of the size of the torpedo damage and where it was located and the problems with her uh, stability and with the problems with her watertight subdivision, she was 
on the edge right from the first moment the torpedo hit, second explosion or no? Do we know what the metacentric height of those ships was? It had to be pretty scary. It was very scary. Uh, I do have that figure somewhere, but I don't have it in front of me, and I haven't looked at it in a while, so I don't want to quote it. And uh, okay. My understanding I, is the ideal is something like about one to maybe 1.2 feet of metacentric height for every 50 foot of breadth. Uh, and, well, I check out stability data anytime I can find it on liners, also warships. Uh, there were some Russian destroyers that were something like... 30 feet wide and had a metacentric height of something like three feet. I'm going, why? Yeah, but no. Um, we'll do a little something here for Terry because she was wondering about the bulkhead arrangement. My understanding is Edward Wilding designed it. Yeah, they, he pointed out in testimony that it was designed that way with exactly that problem in mind to avoid it. Yeah. They, they understood the problems of asymmetric flooding. They absolutely did, Michael. Um, if you read the testimony in the in the Board of Trade inquiry, and I know some here have, um, have. <laughs> they knew exactly what Canard had done with the Lusitania and, and Mauritania. They knew how those ships were designed. They knew the, the problems. They had studied it, and they had decided uh, that a standard transverse only bulkhead design was actually much safer because of the problems of uh, potential lists uh, being induced by any damage along the ship's side. Um, unfortunately, Titanic has gotten a very bad rep uh, from a lot of people who claim that it was badly designed, badly built, built on the cheap, uh, trying to save money, you know, it, unbelievable conspiracy theories that are out there. But if you really you have look any idea at the how context, much fighting I've been doing with that with some people online, give me—I mean, I, I've, I've seen you. I've seen you, Michael. Seen I've seen you go. <laughs> uh, what was that? Well, one guy, Mister Conspiracy Theory, who who thought he was an investigator. These are my findings, dude. You're not a I'm a investigating body. You don't make findings. Give me a break. What's going on about that? Oh, Cunard made a habit of that too with uh, tender ships. Uh, the Queen Mary and the Queen Elizabeth, I understand they had issues too. They did. Queen Mary was uh, known to roll drunkenly over on her side. Um, and it, oh my God. The, the, the stories that I read about the Queen Mary are that um, once she would start rolling in bad weather, even when the weather cleared up, she would keep rolling. And that was something that the company had to fight for a long time. I know sometimes she would show up to Southampton or New York and have to take passengers off in ambulances because they've been injured by the, the roll of the ship. Um, so, yeah, I, Titanic's gotten a bad reputation, but um, very not deserved. Um, Can I ask you a question? What was the first uh, capacity of the first lifeboat uh, to leave in, uh, what was the uh, number of passengers compared to the capacity? Oh, we have that figure actually. That was boat number I, I seven. Right though, here right? on my wall. Um, number seven. Uh, number seven left with uh, left the ship with thir twenty-eight people, and they yeah. picked up six people from number five. And and, and what was the capacity of number seven? Uh, it, it left with 28 people, and what was its actual capacity if it would have? 65. Depends on how you count. 65, 65 is generally yeah. accepted. Yeah. yeah. So the so the people, if if only 28 people got on number seven, uh, they were not concerned uh, at that time about no. uh, uh, the ship's demise. Okay. No, first they officer, weren't. First Officer Murdoch was in charge of the starboard boats, and... Um, He's one of the few officers that we are pretty sure knew exactly what was going on um, because he'd been in command of the ship when it struck the iceberg. He was still the officer of the watch uh, for a while afterwards. And um, my gut instinct, Bill might feel differently, Tad might feel differently. My gut is that because he knew what was going on, he knew how important it was to get the boats away from the ship and we know that some of the officers plan to have the boat swing back to pick up more people. 
but the whole plan just went by the board. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree with Kent and that Murdoch was just trying to get off what people he could because he knew the ship wasn't long for this world. It was get the people off that I can and move to the next one. And the next one was number five and he put uh, Officer Pittman in that one. And I think he said, goodbye, good luck. In other yeah. words, he wasn't expecting to see Pittman again. Shook his hands and it struck yeah. Pittman later on that he, he was like, oh, Murdoch knew what was going on and knew yeah. we probably yeah. weren't gonna see Pittman again. Um, so it's as in, oh, sorry. <laughs> Well, cool hand Murdoch was a supremely good officer. Oh, yeah. uh, I think the way he handled the ship prevented a much worse disaster. Uh, you know, I mean, okay, let's face it. You use an iceberg for a can opener, it doesn't end well. But from the way the, sh the way the ship got damaged, I'm thinking maybe she was already turning to starboard when she hit ice. Because, uh, because was. contact with the ice after boiler room five. Exactly. She What's is interesting so is um, if you study the turning radius of the Titanic and you see where the damage actually ended on the, on the side hull, we know it was uh, about two feet above the floor plates in boiler room six and five. Um, if you study the, the way the ship turned and you look at how the ship flared out from the four peak back to its fullest width it almost it was almost a a one-to-one -one between the turn and the angle of the hull and i think between murdoch's hard of port maneuver and the fact that the hull uh basically stopped getting wider at the point the rough area where the damage ended i think those two things combined and it really shows how close they were to to missing the iceberg entirely. Um, you're only talking inches or a few feet. Well, he Bill nearly pulled were, off a miracle. Bill and I were in Castle Maine, and we ran when we ran some of this stuff in a simulator. So I know very well. What yes, I remember that, Mike. Bill does too. You remember that, Bill? Oh, I, I, I sure do. Know. I sure do. You got pictures. <laughs> I got pictures, and they're up. As far as I know, they're still out there on my website. They are. I still had color in my hair. <laughs> <laughs> so did Do you I. think it was a mistake? Do you think it was a mistake to have Marconi in charge of the radio? Um, so when the Californian uh, contacted the uh, Titanic, uh, the, uh, they, they were told, uh, shut up, shut up. We're trying to work Cape Race. Uh, do, do you think it would have been better if the uh, uh, White Star Line had their own uh, people operating the radio and maybe the message would have got to the captain? I, um, I think there was a lot of looseness in the Marconi regulations at the time. Um, there was anything that needed to get to the attention of a captain was supposed to be preceded by the MSG prefix. And it wasn't just the Californian that didn't do it. There were other ships that we know of that was in contact with Titanic. And we know that there were messages concerning ICE that did not have the MSG prefix. I think in general, uh, the feeling was, this is more of a toy. Um, it's more of a, you use, you use it, the passengers want to send telegrams back and forth. If we get something that needs to go to the bridge, we'll take it to the bridge. And they did. When, when they got an MSG, they, they took it to the, to the bridge. Um, but at the time it was still very much in its infancy. And I think regulation only comes in with experience. And so actually one of the benefits of the Titanic disaster is that it ensured a 24 hour radio watch. They for changed all ships. You're right. They changed, they right. changed all the rules to make it safer. You're right. Yeah. Thank you. No, oh, good question. Jasmine, you've had your hand up for a couple of minutes. Did you have a question too? Um, yeah, it might be a bit of a silly question, um, but I do a lot of research on the musicians on board the ship. Um, 
and I'm not as well versed on the actual layout of the ship, um, more on the people who are on board. Um, so I was just wondering if you know about the location of the pianos on the ship, because a lot of people try and insist that one of the pianists on board was in the trio outside the Café Parisienne, but I didn't think there was a piano for him to play there, so I thought that might move about where everyone actually was in, in the groups. The Olympics a la carte restaurant originally had a Steinway upright, um, but actually Titanic never had the Steinway upright in the a la carte restaurant. That's my understanding. Um, I don't, there's a lot of confusion about the Titanic's orchestra band, how they were broken up, uh, where the pianos were located. Um, I don't think there was a piano anywhere in that region for them to use. I think, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't there a violin, viola, and cello or bass for the um, trio? Um, it's not known if one of them played the viola or not. There's one musician that no one really knows what he played. Um, there is pretty much like university agreed that there was one cello and one violin, but there's a, a lot of things being thrown up in the air recently in regards to like Violet Jessup's memoirs and various other testimony that suggests that there might have been one of the violinists from the quintet might have actually been in the trio or it could have been someone beyond the viola that we didn't know of before uh, who could also play it. But I was just confused because it seemed a lot of people like putting the, the very known pianists into the group and I didn't think he would have been able to play there. Hey, Jasmine, have you read George Behe's Those Brave Fellows? That's the uh, pretty much the only book on the musicians I haven't got yet, but I've, okay. I've told you it so good. You need to read that. That book is excellent. Yep. George Behe does top-notch work and he's went into the band in far more detail than anybody else I've ever seen. He may be, he may have the answers for you in that book. Um, uh, it's only available on lulu.com as far as I know, but it's an excellent book and a good read. Give it as you possibly yeah. can. Yeah, I'm his, his work has it. helped us out tremendously. Um, one of the, one of the more recent findings that he made uh, and pieced together, which, I mean, we've been researching the subject for a long time, but this one absolutely uh, the phrase you could have knocked us over with a feather when we when we found his findings um is that the the band when they were playing during the disaster likely played in the first class entrance on the boat deck until about two o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. when they moved out onto the starboard, starboard side boat yeah. deck, not the port side as is always portrayed that was one of the things that when we were doing On a Sea of Glass, we knew where that portrayal started. That was in A Night to Remember by Walter Lord, one of our favorite books. But we tried to track down where Lord had gotten the idea they'd gone to the port side boat deck. And Bill, if I remember correctly, we couldn't find. Not that I remember. Not that I remember. But George found a couple of people who said they ended up on the starboard side boat deck. Not just one, but several people said they saw them there. And we've got revisions ready to go into on a sea of glass to correct that. Absolutely. There, that's one of the wonderful things about Titanic. And also it's maddening for, for people like Bill and I who are trying to, uh, get the best information out there is um, it's always, you're always learning. And in many ways it can be very humbling because, you know, you come out there with the best information you have and you say, this is what makes sense. And then someone else turns out or you yourself find something and it's like, you just kind of like, okay, well, we have to revise the jigsaw pieces and uh, the jigsaw puzzle pieces and figure out where they go now. Um, but, I that yeah, yeah. 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 Well, we we'll try historical we'll studies, everybody. They just do. Seven. 
I know they had two violinists. One was Jock Hume, and the other, the concert, the leader was uh, Wallace Hartley. Yeah, and then so they also had a Prince on, on the violin as well. Yeah. Um, going back to George Behe's book, as I recall, in the beginning parts of it, he gives a short bio on all eight of the musicians. So that should tell you who played what. And we suspect several, I'm speaking now just off the top of my head, um, I suspect several of the, the musicians could play multiple instruments. So, that's, a but, good, that's a good point, Bill, because yeah. A, you tend to have a specialized musician that, you know, they play a specific instrument Maybe they have a little bit of background in another instrument that they learned. Uh, but back then, people tended to be a lot more, um, musicians tended to have a lot more at their disposal. So they might, they might be able to play piano or violin or viola and, or all of them, or, you know, it's, um, so it, it, Violet Jessup's memoirs, that book is, um, I love the book, I love her, recollections but you do also have to remember that that book is more or less fixed in time i think it came out in 1998 um so a lot of the annotation in that book is very much out of date and george's work is the most current work on the i i, I second bill <laughs> go to george's I, I think george's book is maybe two years old at the most yeah yeah does that help? Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to make a quick comment. Um, you know, the, I think a lot of the movies have them playing outside all the time. Well, that, like, like he's saying, they had to play inside because I used to play the violin. So there, the instruments would also get, because they play wood, it would affect the wood and also affect the strings because the, it, they're made of cat gut and they would go out of tune all the time. So they'd have to play in, indoors would make sense they would play indoors yeah well, that's we, very we true terry they played yeah. they played inside up until fairly close to the end right I can't mention right. probably until two o'clock right. by two o'clock things are looking really bad right and it, you know it get, it's getting to the question of do we want to stay in here where it's kind of warm and chance getting trapped right or we need to get out on the deck where we can at least try right a lot of a lot of people may know that um, when I'm not writing books, I work in my family business on pianos. Um, oh. I know Bill knows this because frequently when he uh, when he's messaging me asking us of that, I have to tell him I'm under a piano, quite literally. So one of the other things that's been a big question through the years is, you know, if if they did play on the boat deck, how did they get the piano out in the boat deck? And the short answer is, they didn't. They wouldn't have, <laughs> especially. Either either side would not have been easy, but the port side where everyone has them playing um, would have been particularly difficult because the upright piano was a very bulky, very cumbersome object. And not only was it attached to the ship to prevent it from rolling around, so they would have had to detach it, but then there, the exit was a 90 degree turn through two very narrow doors onto the port yeah. side. But there is no way they could have gotten the piano out to the port side of the boat deck. The starboard side, uh, they would have had to walk it around uh, the grand staircase and out the, the two sets of doors. Um, would have been a straight shot. That's probably how they brought it in to begin with. But <laughs> that was not happening at 2 o'clock in the morning. So th the piano almost certainly stayed in its original location until the, the very end. So You might have played okay. another instrument. Mm -hmm. it's possible maybe the i don't know i don't i don't know everything but the pianist might have played another instrument um, yes that could if, it was, be it. if it was um theo braley he wasn't able to return home after getting right. off the mauritania so it's possible i don't think he would have had the chance to pick up his cello back oh, in okay. london before he was able to get onto the Titanic, so I don't think he might have had, he could have brought his flute with him, but I don't think anyone's mentioned a flute being present. No, no. And I don't think he had it with him on the Carpathia during the voyage before he then was transferred to the Mauritania and then back to England. We, we all know there wasn't a coronet, that we know. They were pretty much a string ensemble anyway, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Okay. Well, remember, we always go to the the, the in a uh, pigeon ford, and then they have mm -hmm. that room of the for the musicians in the in the in their uh, that the, 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 there, yeah. And uh, so not, none of them mention a, a you know a flute or anything like that. Yeah, I, I don't think he, he would have written on him anyway. Right. I do have the account but of the one who saw one thing. of the musicians running with a cello, I think it was, with a spike dragging across the deck. Was that Beastie yeah, who saw the, that? The, yeah. the spike thing is where they put the thing where the cello rests on the floor. Yeah, I remember the account. I don't remember anything other than the spike dragging across the deck. <laughs> it, it was it was Beastly. OK. Oh, OK. Ah, Beastly. He was there. Very observant. Terry? Hmm? I mean, Jill. Jill, I see the hand up and I. Sorry, Terry. <laughs> That's okay. All right. I have a question. I have something from Cyril, which I already asked earlier, but he asked, um, I asked earlier for someone if you were going to think about a second edition. And I know that you guys had said, you know, you're just taking a break from doing this one, but uh, Cyril wanted to know, because he he speaks French, so he wanted me to ask for you, will there ever be a second edition, do you think? This book? That's a good question. We've gotten a lot of inquiries on all of our books about different languages, subsequent editions, and except for the ones that we self-publish, like Titanic Solving the Mysteries, uh, we have to direct all those questions back to the publisher, uh, whether it's on a sea of glass or whether it's this book. We know that they're doing a new printing of recreating Titanic. Um, and actually there's a couple of updates that we're gonna sneak in there. We had a couple of eagle-eyed uh, readers point out a couple of things that we actually carried over from on a sea of glass that nobody had found in 10 years, but they spotted it very quickly in recreating Titanic. So we've got a couple of little fixes that are gonna be in there. Um, and uh, we know that's coming very soon because the first printing, they, they ran through that very quickly. Okay, awesome. And my question was, how long did it take for you all, I don't know, um, to put together the light, well, you probably can't see it, but the, uh, the LIFO distancing and locations, that chart, and you know where they all were. How long did it take for you all to compile the information? That's a that's a good question. Bill is our resident lifeboat expert, um, and when we were working on the animation for last April's anniversary in uh, twenty twenty one. Um, we were working very closely with um, the animator and they were basically making that entire animation to our specifications. And we didn't have a lot of time to refine everything, but we had a number of uh, conversations over Zoom about where the lifeboats needed to be because the animator needed to put the lifeboat in the water when we said it got to the water and then he needed to get it to a certain <clears throat> certain point at a certain time. And so he needed to know how quickly to do that. You know, did it go this way? Did it go that way? I remember very clearly Bill um, having to say, let me, let me do some research on this. And uh, that, that was, that, those were actually very, that was exciting research that we did to get that put together for the animation, wasn't that, Bill? Yeah, it, it, when you actually start looking at what people, where people said the lifeboats were, and I'm just gonna make up a number here. Let's say somebody in lifeboat seven says, we were a mile away. Somebody else in the same lifeboat says we're a half mile away. So which one is it? Um, when you actually start looking at what people are saying, you see a lot of differences. We had to go with um, more directions than anything else. And then trying to look at what sounds reasonable. And what were they seeing? If they were seeing people on the deck running around, 
it's unlikely they were two miles away. And again, I'm just making up an example there. Um, those lifeboat distances from the ship are, are guesstimates of what sounds reasonable. Um, we can't prove them. We can kind of say where the ship, where the lifeboats were in relation to the Titanic, but the distances are best guess. And that was based in part on an analysis of not only, you know, how quick does a lifeboat row? Uh, and of course you have, you know, who's, who's at the oars? Is it passengers, you know, first class women who, you know, weren't used to doing a lot of manual labor, who had no knowledge of an oar, or was it crewmen who were more trained to row the boats? Um, you, you had questions of competence of people at the oars. We also discovered that there were a lot of lifeboats that they pulled off a certain distance and stopped because they didn't want to get too far from the ship or too far from other lifeboats. And then only later on, when it became clear to them that the ship was actually sinking, did they row further out. And so you didn't have like this one continuous journey. You had these boats go out a certain way, stop, and then after a while, and how long is that? So one of the things that we did is for each one of these lifeboats, we asked the animator to set us down in each lifeboat. And from that camera angle, we sat there with the accounts of the people who were in those boats, and we would read the accounts out loud, and we would look at what we were seeing on our screen that the ship was doing, and we would compare the two. There were moments when our neck, the hairs on the backs of our neck stood up because it was so clear that we were very close to what they were actually seeing. That was a great addition to the book, I thought. Yeah, everything was great. Thank you. Does anyone else have any questions? Or I don't know if um, any, David wants to take questions. If he wants any book. Or if you have anything for Cyril, I am here talking to him via Facebook and we are using Google Translate to talk to each other. One of the things that we can't thank our artists enough for all the hard work that they did to artists like David or Cyril or uh, any one of them. Uh, the book would not have been the same without their participation, their help. And we know that there was a lot of, uh, because of the, the time crunch that we were on in putting together the illustrations, we know that it caused a lot of work on their part on a tight deadline. And we, we appreciate all their work. Did you, did you want to say something, David? Did you want to say hello to all your fans that have <laughs> been enjoying your work. Thank you guys. Well, I wanted to show you the actual painting. So Ooh, I'll, great. I'll, I'll show you guys the actual painting. It's right here. Oh, wow. <laughs> Oops, I'm in That's a the first time I've seen it. <laughs> Hold on, I'm gonna pin him so that um, every time someone talks, it doesn't disappear. Um, and it's painted on linen. So, yeah, so wow. just wanted to share with you all. Is, how long did it take to do that, David? Well, um, like Kent was saying, we, we had this little meeting, um, Kent, Bill, and Tad, and, you know, we wanted to do something fairly new, something that is rarely Never seen. Never been seen before. Exactly, wow. <laughs> exactly. Um, and we're familiar with the... Father Brown photo of Southampton and and we thought oh it would be cool if we had an image of you know uh Francis Brown looking out and saying oh here's that image I want to capture so the painting was uh focused on his ex ex experience and um yeah it was it was a fantastic opportunity and ex experience working with Kent, Bill, Tad. I mean, they're just the most knowledgeable, that down to earth, you know, dudes. Really cool <laughs> guys, so it was great. We were, we were very fortunate also that you have um, an extensive amount of research, David, on how Southampton and that waterfront there where Titanic was looked, right. which really helped a lot. 
Yeah, I actually, ch check this out. I just recently got these negatives from oh. Southampton. So this is, I mean, you can't see them, but uh, I mean, uh, yeah. So I'm an advent, you know, a collector when it comes to Southampton. Um, I have these postcards that I'm looking at right now that just arrived. Um, and, and so, yeah, I, I collect everything that's related with Southampton. I'm very, uh, like, interested in its uh, history. Um, I'm very fortunate to have this, um, like, small collection of the, constru the construction of the White Star Docks, uh, specifically for the, uh, the sisters, you know? So... If you have any questions or anything, any feedback, uh, I'm, I'm open to it. And um, yeah, just very thankful and grateful for the opportunity to exhibit and share the artwork with all, all of you in this fantastic sort of uh, reservoir of, you know, like, I mean, just amazing artists from all over the world, which is really cool. It's very cool. If you if the members don't know who David is, go over to David E. Oliveira, O L I V E R A. You can see his. I've been following him for years, and and he, David, you do amazing things with water. You can almost like reach in and yeah. Um, oh, yeah. your detail is. People don't know who you are. Thank you. Um, to look into you. I think that's one of my favorite uh, portraits of water that I've ever seen painted uh, is the one that I think it was with the Olympic in the background and uh, the kind of greenish tint. It's on page 156 in the book. Yeah, I it just really looks like you could reach in and that it looks like real ocean right there. I, I love that one. Thank you. Thank you so much. Beautiful. Beautiful. We love what you do with the water. Hey, Terry, did I see that you had a question for David while he was talking? She seems to be gone. I don't, oh, I'm no, here. here. Oh, there you are. I couldn't find you. I was trying to look for the picture. Um, <laughs> I, mean, I do have a question for David. Um, now, you painted that on uh, lint. I mean, on lint. On, on, what did he say he painted it on? Linen. Linen. Sorry, I didn't mean to say lint. Sorry. It's okay. <laughs> How did you get that picture, get that painting to the, the authors so they can put it in the book? Uh, we photographed it. Um, there's several ways you could do that. Uh, you could take a picture, which is what, you know, like traditionally, that's what you would do. But nowadays you could scan an image of this size, you know, because it's not, it's, it's 16 inches by uh, 20. So it's relatively, you know, like a small painting. You could have it digitally scanned into a, um, into a high resolution, you know, like image. Mm -hmm. So, yes. Now I have a that tend question. to preserve the colors more accurately, David, when you scan it instead of photographing it? Right. Um, both um, with the photography, it's a little bit tricky because you need to consider the lights, uh, you know, the temperature, because the, the, that all so, sort of reflects on the, the end results of the colors uh, of, of the reproduction of the print. Um, so digitally, you have a bit more of a control of faithfully preserving the colors. So, yeah. <laughs> I, have, I have a second picture, a second question, I'm sorry. Sure. Um, no. I'm I'm looking now at page 156. I mean, this is a gorgeous picture of a painting of the HMT Olympic. Now, oh, yes. how do you do you? Uh, <laughs> I mean, is that the Britannic or the Olympic? Yeah, the Olympic. Um, now, do you do you draw the outline? Do you draw the outline, or do you just you know, or do you just paint from? Do you understand what I'm asking? Yeah, just yeah. Paint? The the idea it's it's kind of like what we did with um, with this painting of Francis Brown. It's always a a vision. So of all the images we've seen, you know, uh, of, of the of the ship of the passengers, um, 
they're always this idea of like, well, what if I was the person looking at it from, let's say from the decks looking up, or what if I'm the photographer? What if I'm observing the photographer take the image that I'm seeing, you know? So it's always this vision of like, oh, there's this window. What if I get in that window and explore it a bit more? Uh -huh. So with the idea of, of, of a painting, let's see if I have, um, you know, David, I actually have the draft of this painting that you sent us. Would you mind if I shared that and showed everyone sure, so they could yeah. see how this began? Yay. Yes, please. Okay, let me let me do that then, because I think everyone would be really fascinated. They've they've heard about this, but uh, let me share. I'm my amazed screen. how he got the ship straight and this and that. I'm like, how did he do that? <laughs> here's here's a, a painting. This is what's called. I mean, this is a line draft so it's, a, it's on a transparent sheet it's really old yeah um from this is the architectural rendering okay um so from that i do like a, a pencil drawing just to get oh, so you do do a pencil drawing yeah. you, you, okay and, and then finally you get this guy Ah, so beautiful. So that's the final product at your show. Work in it's, progress. It's, yeah, it's like work in progress. Oh, so. okay. So then you, you draw that and then you paint it all in. That Correct. Oh, I got it now. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's very labor intensive, but it's, it's a lot of fun. So, so let me oh, show yeah. you the original. Oh, I love this picture. That was the painting. Oh, yeah. oh okay. Oh, uh, yay. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> this was our first introduction into what it was going to look like. Um, right. And immediately, I mean, we could tell the angle was just a uh, beautiful angle. You can see the gangplank here in the, in the foreground mm -hmm. where uh, Brown was eventually going to be placed. And we could e immediately tell, you know, this angle looks so much like the photograph. Mm -hmm. And uh, David had done a lot of research into, you know, the gangways um, and how they all looked and it, it was just awesome. And then, so this was, this was great when we spotted, you know, spotted it to begin with when we saw it, we were like, oh, this is going to be fantastic. But I don't think we could possibly have imagined uh, when all was said and done what the, what the final picture was going to look like. It was truly awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it was a lot of fun. It was, it's, it's, I mean, I have a joy just like, you know, with the research that you guys just look into, into every little thing and, uh, and then some. <laughs> so it was, it was a pleasure. I, I, I actually had to redo the outfit of the, of the female figure. Uh, because one of the things I ran into is that in the first version of the painting she's wearing a 1908 you know summer uh uh leisure you know like outfit and then i showed it to a buddy of mine um randy and he was like david it's a beautiful painting but the dress is not a 1911 1912 outfit so I had to redo the painting to just get the, you know, the outfit to the period, which wow. is, yeah, it was, it was awesome. It was really cool. And fashion oh. was changing very quickly in 1912, so. Right. He didn't catch it when we saw the draft. I, I'm not <laughs> that up on what women's fashions were in 1912, so I'm glad, uh, <laughs> glad that got caught. And it, I think it added a lot to the, to the finished painting. True. Yes. Yeah, there's people. That's what I love about Titanic community. There's somebody that's really good at pointing out something. <laughs> Sometimes the best thing is knowing who to ask. Yeah. Absolutely, Bill. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. We, you know, I'm, just bra I'm just bragging kind of on David while you talk and showing you some of his amazing work. Can you guys see that I mean, beautiful wow. water? Yeah, Bill, you're absolutely right. There's certain, there's certain, if you want to talk about um, 
you know, the nuts and bolts, you go talk to Bill Sorter. If you want to talk about lifeboats, we talk to Bill, we, we talk to you. You know, it's like everybody seems to have their different department of some, you know. It's Very true. Much so. Absolutely, absolutely right. Um, I mean, I could not have done what David did. Uh, I could not do what George B. He does, yeah. but I kind of have my own little niche. Yeah, <laughs> it's true. Well, that's what makes this this community so wonderful. If you want a conspiracy killer, go to uh, Mike Standard. Yeah. I detest Did he leave? Very. Oh, here's David working on his paintings. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> I love your work. Thank you, Joe. Thank when you. I go to the ocean or water, I say, oh, that looks like one of David's paintings. Instead of looking at your painting, <laughs> it looks like water. <laughs> it, you want somebody it, for Titanic books? That's Jill's department. <laughs> it's, it's, it's like really oh, weird yeah. uh, because a lot of people, uh, um, uh, you know, like in the art world, you know, like I'm very much involved in the art world and they're like what is this thing with titanic that you have <laughs> and it's it's kind of weird because i think titanic is uh one of those uh um life things that has has really allowed me to travel all over the world you know like meet really amazing people from all you know like walks of life um and so to me, it's, it's kind of like, yeah, this is, this is, uh, this, you know, this is my thing and I don't need to be an expert or know everything to, to appreciate, you know, the work that Kent does and Bill and all these awesome, you know, um, researchers. Yes, Michael. I just wanted to say that what I was seeing here in the screen here, a lot of your work looks a lot like real world photographs. It's very good. Isn't Thank it good? I, just, I love Thank writing on his work. We'll, we'll tell you a, a story that not everyone has, uh, has heard about this book. Um, we, we knew that we wanted to introduce each artist to the readers. And we wanted to, to do a whole chapter. And with our word count, we figured we could give each artist about X number of words and we had, we'd get one profile photo for them that we could use. And we conclude a website and, and your, how to contact them to support their work. And we started getting, we put out this questionnaire to each artist and we started getting the responses back. And there was one thing that almost every single artist uh, said in their responses and it was that they were inspired by the work of Ken Marshall. Um, and so Pat and Bill and I were, were looking at these responses and we knew that we were very close on our word count and our picture cap. And I remember the three of us talking and we said, it's late. But I think we have to ask Ken to do a forward for the book because every single one of these artists has been inspired by his work. And not only do I, we thought he, A, deserved to know what a positive effect he's had. And Ken is one of the most humble people I've ever had dealings with. But we thought that it would it would be a, a wonderful boon to new artists, both the ones in our book and other up and coming artists who may not have the the confidence to to put their work out there. So we talked to our editor Amy, and we said, "What would you think? Do you think we could squeeze a forward by Ken Marshall in if he would agree to do it?" And she said. Yeah, let's let's see. So we went to Ken, and we asked him. And I, I don't. I was nervous about asking Ken. I I don't know about you guys, but um, Ken is like one of the most. And he's like he's so well known. And he's been out there. He's been out there doing this since I was very young. Um, I think he's been doing it since before I was was even born. He's been doing these paintings, and um, 
So yes, I was nervous to ask. I yeah. Think he, he's been doing it before you. Yeah. As, so we asked, we were nervous and Ken, um, we told him that our, the artists that we're working with are, are each telling us that it was primarily your artwork that got them started. And uh, Ken was blown out of the water um, to hear it. Uh, I think he was in almost a state of disbelief, you know, that his artworks still have such an effect. And he was very pleased to do the forward for us and kind of, um, I don't know if endorse is the right word, but kind of encourage, you know, the, the work of all these younger artists and all their different mediums. And so it was a real privilege to be able to do that. And we didn't tell any of the artists. Um, <laughs> we, we kept that as a, a secret. Um, and only once we had the forward in hand and knew that it was going to work, uh, did we actually let them know. And their response was uh, over the moon. Um, so we were very pleased. It, it feels like in some ways, this book kind of bridges multiple generations of, of Titanic interests um, and kind of brings the Titanic community a little bit closer together. So, David, I did want to ask, what brought you to Titanic? Um, well, actually, it was um, a book by Ken Marshall. <laughs> uh, it, was, um, it was one of those like scholastic books and uh, I saw the paintings before I knew what Titanic was and who Ken is and 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 then subsequently I'm a huge you know like movie fan and so I saw his artwork um, in the movie you know like industry and uh, and I wanted to be a matte painter. Uh, unfortunately for me that profession was slowly being taken over by you know like digital media so like everything was now cgi computer generated image so the painters of the past that that, that you know would work for hollywood uh were kind of it was like their sunset sort of like uh you know a profession um but ken's um work was really one of those things that got me interested in, in, in the history, uh, in the narrative, and just how he, he, he has this like really just way of talking about it and, and his artwork speaks for itself. So um, yeah, he, he was definitely that little, you know, like window. Back in the late 90s, early, no, I mean, late 80s, early 90s. So, um, really cool guy. Yeah. What about you, Ted? I think I read in Bill's um, summary on Amazon or something that it was the night to remember that got him started in junior high school, I believe. And what about you, Kent? The Bill? Well, oh, yeah, night to remember got, got me started when I was 12 years old in seventh grade. Okay. But I had previously seen A Night to Remember on TV and also the 1953 Titanic. So they kind of got me started, but then finding the book pushed me even farther. And that was a very, very long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> awesome. I like to tease Tad and Kent that they're both younger than my kids. <laughs> Fun fact, Tad and I were born on exactly the same day. Oh, you share a birthday. Yeah. It's crazy. Not even different years, same year. We haven't compared times of, of day, but that would probably be a little weird. But it, it is, it's, it's amazing that, you know, we get to work with, with Bill. Um, we're, we're a great three-man team the way we work together, you know, we, we kind of keep each other grounded. And the larger team that we work with, uh, Sam Halpern and Mark Chernside and, and so many others, um, it's a really a privilege to, to work with them. We're and just like so we talked about earlier, we all have our little niches. And when we're working with, with Sam and Mark, we all kind of fit together our pieces. If we want to talk about propellers, we talk to Mark Turnside. <laughs> right. Everyone has their thing that they're good at. 
Mm -hmm. And did you say already how you got started with Titanic? I forgot. I, I didn't. Um, my dad is about Bill's age, and um, he was very much a Titanic and ocean liner buff. And uh, when I was very small, I was an avid reader. I was a spontaneous reader. I think when I was two, my parents said, and I just tore apart every book that they had on their shelf. I just loved reading. A Night to Remember was one of those books that my dad had. Um, there was also a large format book called Sail, Steam, and Splendor that uh, my dad had. I, I loved that book. And uh, I, I also was, you know, the Poseidon Adventure, A Night to Remember, um, I wasn't too keen on the 1953 Titanic movie. I kind of laughed at all the inaccuracy. The five-year-old me laughing at the inaccuracies in the movie. Um, Raised the Titanic um, was a huge influence on me, the movie. Um, and it just, uh, when I was about four, my dad brought home a, uh, a 1350 scale model of the ship for us to work on together. And to a four-year-old, that's as good as the real thing. Um, so it kind of became our thing and it just, it, it skyrocketed my, my interest. It, it just snowballed. And uh, by the time I saw the Cameron film in 97, I, I was sure that I wanted to do a Titanic book. And, uh, I didn't actually publish my first book until a few years after that in late 2004, early 2005. Um, but uh, there was never any doubt in my mind. I, I love researching the subject. To, it just fascinates me. Thank you for sharing. When I was researching for today, I, um, I was looking for a little bio for you guys before I thought maybe you guys could just do your bios. But when I went on to Google, <clears throat> This is what came up for you, Bill. All your Lego Titanic episodes. <laughs> <laughs> well, that that Lego Titanic you see there, that's Shelley Binder's Lego Titanic. She is the great granddaughter of Titanic survivor Leor, Leah Axe. And I was up and she was interviewing me while I was working on her Titanic. If you look at my image on the screen, you'll see a Lego Titanic and that's mine. I built okay. that. Oh, so these are all Shelly's. You have your own? Yeah, I have my own. Oh, I have to find that. When, I was, when I was younger, I loved building sets. Um, and it turns out I still do, even though I'm not younger anymore. <laughs> uh, those are what? Look at this. Um, Rafe wrote best book ever on a sea of glass. <laughs> Oh, That's a beautiful that. review. I don't know if you guys have ever seen that, but I highly encourage it. It caught us off guard when we saw it because, you know, we didn't know the individual. We hadn't asked him to do a review, but um, he, he's a confirmed Titanic enthusiast. And the way he um, was very clear how much he enjoyed the book, it, it really, we were like, wow, it was awesome. I'll put it in the book club so everybody can see it. Uh, the um, the uh, Amazon in the U.S. has not released our book yet. Why we don't know. But they're saying they're saying either September first or November first for releasing it. It's available in um, overseas in Amazon.co.uk. <clears throat> and Kent mentioned earlier they're already going back for a second printing, which is good. Um, we had our signed in numbers editions. We've sold out of that. And we now have unsigned editions that we're selling through Kent's website. So how many books have you sold so far, do you know? Well, you mean we or them? Well, uh, how many of these books were sold total? Yeah. So I'll, I'll give you some, some idea of I, Dad and Bill and I talked. We knew that the book was coming out. We knew we were going to do a signing numbered edition. We always limit to 500 copies. It seems like a good round number. Uh, we've never hit 500 copies. Uh, we've not even remotely. Um, we have some uh, individuals who always come back for the next edition order from us. Um, 
and we appreciate their return business, but we've never been that popular. Uh, we've never, our books just don't seem to sell that well. And um, so I told Tad and Bill, you know, we can, we can get the copies over here and I can ship them out from here. And it's not, not going to be that much work. <laughs> okay. Now you well, have to share. Um, we limited it to 500 and it's probably a good thing that we did because um, within a month of the book's release, all the 500 copies have been spoken for. Now that may not seem like a lot, but to give you some idea, uh, we've got about a quarter of Honesty of Glasses signature run spoken for after 10 years. And it was the same quantity run. So we got hit over here. Uh, I had boxes of books that were stacked up halfway to my ceiling um, in a long, along a wall, along, along the wall, several feet. And um, my wife and I uh, packaged them up and each one by hand, each signature. Uh, you have to put the plate in the book at just the right angle or you, you, know, you can't make a mistake. You have to put the bookmark in. You have to number the certificate of authenticity. So in a, month, in a month's time, I think we spent more time packaging those books and shipping them out. And international shipping was not fun. Um, not fun at all. But it, it really just blew us away when we realized how, how much this book was it seemed to be striking a chord with people. They really wanted to, to have that visual representation and that paired back um, narrative uh, from On a Sea of Glass with all the updates in it. It just, it really just seemed to be uh, the right book at the right time. It, it, it's stunned us, it really has. And people like love pictures said, yeah. and paintings and drawings and and like we said, the publisher has gone back to print now. So that says something else. Back to print in what? Um, less than two months. That sound about right, Ken? Is that your hand, Michael? Did you have a question? <laughs> I think Phil asked you a question. I'm just, I, I was just trying to unmute the thing. Yeah, uh, I was just going to point out, I think the reason this is so popular is a lot of people are very visual these days, yes. but the thing about the work here, what you've done here, as well as what the Titanic Iron and Glory people do, you, know, you can look at some dry as bones plans, and I have the beverage plans, who doesn't, that doesn't take this seriously, and you kind of get a technical sense of the layout, but it's not, it's not for real. But then you see the recreations, three dimensions, you know, and you see Scotland Road as it really would have been uh, not all that neat, not all that clean, kind of looked in. And you get a sense for what these ships would have been like as operational uh, vessels. Now, I know, you know, you know, following some of the stuff that's been done, I know how to get down into the boiler room. You know, said, go down in the boiler room six. I've seen the fireman's tunnel because of the kind of work you guys have been doing. Yeah. Nice. And, and the work of the artist, too. Incredible. Yeah. Just takes yeah, you I, there. I had the situation just a couple of months ago. I was editing a book for someone, and um, they said the person was going to have to go from here to here to here to here. And because I had just looked at one of the paintings in, in our book, I went, well, well, no, they shouldn't have to go that distance. They should be able to go dim, 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 and down. And I went and checked the beverage plans, like Mike mentioned, and the, the painting was right. So I told the author, hey, how about this? I think you need to change this piece. And he did. Um, so the, the book even helped me visualize what was going on. <laughs> Awesome. One of the things we should probably point out about this book is um, there was no room for endnotes for original citations <laughs> back to a, 
If you've ever had a chance to look at on a sea of glass, you'll know that there are hundreds, there are thousands of endnotes in that book, back to original accounts, original source material to expound on this. We never had that kind of space in this book with this narrative. So what we're telling people is, if you read something in this book, and you're thinking this doesn't jive with what I've read before, what I've seen in this movie or that movie, or what I've heard in this show or that program, it's there for a reason. It, this isn't just something that we kind of cooked up on our own. And it's a distilled down, a boiled down format of on a sea of glass. And if there's ever any question about any of the findings, you know, how many were on board, how many were in each lifeboat, what time did the lifeboat leave? Go back to on a sea of glass and go back to the end note citations and and read the end notes for that question. And that will tell you why we chose to go this way or that on certain points. I wonder if they should be sold as a pair. Incidentally, I, I, did, I wanted to mention that um, I have copy number 57 out of 500 on my On a Sea of Glass. And my recreating Titanic is also 57 out of 100. Are you kidding? <laughs> <laughs> That's pretty cool. So whatever book you put out next, I'll have to request that number, I guess. Contact us in advance. We'll set aside 57 for you. <laughs> Just remind us. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so buy them together, guys. Awesome. Let's see. Well, we think your book's going to be book of the year. We, I've gotten a little bit of criticism in the book club about stating that so early in the year, but um, I've just, I, you know, I've just seen so much excitement about this book and happiness. And um, I think, like, as Michael said, a lot of people are visual. And so what you've done here is brought all the details, or well, many of the details from Honesty of Glass to to life a second of assessment yeah it's brilliant oh, i'm sorry jill oh it's okay no go ahead my second assessment I mean, this this is an awesome book and i think nice. that, that the 110th anniversary was almost more exciting for me because of this book and because of your live stream on the anniversary than the 100th anniversary i don't know if anyone else felt that way this year I was talking to Graham Judd from Australia, and he was already, he's already planning for the 125th and even the 150th. And I told him, I'm not going to be around long enough for the 150th. And I don't even know about the 125th. You never know. Well, when, when Bill talks like that, I tell him nonsense. Just think positively. Yes. <laughs> we need you, man. So... No, but we also appreciate the support of all of the members of the Titanic Book Club. Um, you've really, you've really been there to help us out um, and spread word of the book, and it's been, uh, it's been tremendous for us. And I know Tad really wanted to be here tonight. He feels bad he couldn't, uh, but I'm sure that um, he would probably feel the same way, right, Bill? And uh, yes, definitely. He, I'm sure he'd like to say hello to everybody too, um, and and thank you all for your support. So. Well, maybe we can Definitely. schedule something that where he can be there. That would be. Fun. I think he'd like that a lot. And I think there's other many members that signed up for today that weren't able to make it, so maybe they could make that one too. Awesome. Thank you so much for being here with us. Does anyone else have anything to say? We've had some quiet members. You can raise your hand, or you can put up the little hand. Well, I want to thank you for including me. I'm not really an active member. I first learned about Titanic from my grandmother talking to a friend, and she referenced somebody whom she knew who perished in the sinking. And I've been trying to find out who that was, but grandmother has long since passed on, so... But I've still, I'm just interested in the ship and the social, um, as this, the people, the time period in history, and 
so on. And I want to thank you all. This has been very informative. I've learned a lot. I've You've uh, questions I thought of you've answered somebody else either asked them or you answered them. So I want to again thank you so much. Thanks thank for you for joining here. us. Yeah. Um, Glad we could help. Did oh, I see Bruce had his hand up too? Go ahead, Bruce. On uh, Leia, somebody mentioned Leia X. And yes, that was me. Yes. And is my memory correct? Didn't she have a problem with her little baby on the. Uh, oh, boy, did she. Yes. Oh, boy, tell tell she. that. That's mm -hmm. an interesting story. She, nope. she was down in the thir third class in the stern of the ship. I'm going to make this a fairly short story. And when the ship started going down, she went up on deck, looked around, saw a lifeboat in the water went back down into the ship to get little Frank. And when she got back up on deck, things were kind of chaotic. Um, they weren't really letting people from the, the aft well deck up to the boat decks, but she found some people that were willing to lift her up the deck houses. And she was lifted up the deck houses, but during that she lost track of the baby. Baby was 10 months old, as I recall. She lost track of the baby. She got in a lifeboat. Uh, the baby was put into a different lifeboat. And when she got to the Carpathia, she doesn't know where her kid is. She is, is he dead? Is he alive? And what Shelly Binder said to me was that she was on the Carpathia for a couple of days. And then she happened to see a little baby in the arms of another woman and she said, that's my baby. The woman was not really wanting to let it go. No. She... They were taken up to um, Captain Rostron to make a determination. And evidently the baby had a strawberry shaped birthmark on his, on his, somewhere on his body. Yeah. They looked at it and that, that proved that it was Leah Axe's son, Frank. Yeah. So um, she got the baby on the Carpathia, but all this stress. Um, she had some mental issues after after the sinking. Yeah. Thanks um, for telling this story. I just thought it was fascinating what happened to her. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Shelly has said she's working on a, a biography of her of her great grandmother. So hopefully at some point there'll be more out there. Oh, great. Bill, wasn't there something about the, the there was something about she named her Sarah Carpathia or something like that. Wasn't there something in the story uh, about that? Yes. Um, there was another baby after Frank, and <laughs> there seemed to be some kind of confusion. Uh, she wanted to name the baby Sarah Carpathia, but somebody messed up and it became Sarah Titanic. Um, <laughs> uh, they finally got it all straightened out, but okay. it was not good for a while. Oh, that's my cat. <laughs> uh, <laughs> One of my cats. Uh, I don't know if you saw earlier, my cat had jumped up on my counter behind me, so. Uh, I love animals. And I saw Dave. You know she's not supposed to do that, but she, she knew I was distracted. And, and, <laughs> so. Pets are like kids. You're on the phone. They want to be there. Yeah. yeah. Melissa or Marcel, if you guys, or Peter, I don't know if you guys want to add anything. I can, in the meantime, I can tell you that Cyril said he was very happy to have been able to participate in the book and he wishes and congratulates to all the people who were involved in this fabulous book. Thank you very much, Cyril. Thank you very much. We and we're glad you were part of it. Yeah, definitely. Um, Peter Thank can't you. speak right now, but he's letting me know of a messenger that it was a really interesting meeting and he was really glad to hear all of your insights. Thank you, Peter. Uh, I'm glad you're here, Peter. Thank you so much for your time. Almost two hours. So Absolutely. Thank you so much. We really hope that we can meet again with you with, um, with Ted. Well, thank you for hostessing this.
Thank you, Jill. This was awesome. Oh, yeah, gosh. it's been, it's been great. Thank you so much. We haven't had a really good book meeting in a while. Maybe this will kick us well, up again. Per outstanding. It's mm -hmm. one of the best of I've ever been at. Oh, that's because Kenton. Dylan. Yes, Kent. <laughs> We appreciate being invited too, Jill, very much. Yeah, well, we appreciate you and all your hard work and bringing Titanic to us in this way. And, you know, there's a lot of books out there that we shake our heads at and we really don't want to encourage people to buy. So if you are wondering where to spend your money, you know, that's what the book club is for, to try to help people to discern which books are worthy and these books are worthy because of all the, the wonderful research that's gone in. You know, I think some people think it's easy to write a book, you know, you can just go on the internet and cut and paste and, but it, you know, it's so much more than that as, as you both know. I mean, how many hours of work went into on a sea of glass, would you say, combined maybe? Even beyond the hours of work, there's the years of before that of reading and researching and, you know, you don't sit there, the, a book like, our books, it's not just the year we spent working on the book. It's the years and years before that leading up to it. Um, I mean, I started reading about Titanic in 1963. Is that the beginning of my research? Well, yeah, kind of. Yeah. It takes a long time. Well, we yeah, appreciate I, your hard work and, and we want to honor you for your hard work by you know, supporting you. And I see Michael has his hand up. Go ahead, Michael. I just wanted to say, don't waste your money on anything that advocates a conspiracy theory, because it was like Terry yeah. said, I demolish conspiracy theories. I hate them. They're just, I mean, they're, they're so excessively complicated that it beggars belief that anyone could go for them. The Titanic was underinsured for heaven's sakes. So, I mean, and it was we so unnecessary. If they wanted to destroy the ship, there's no need to swap identities. Just set set it on fire in the middle of the night. Yes, that, yeah. But don't waste your time on conspiracy theories. Yeah. What we tend to find is that they these conspiracy theories are um, very superficial, and the people behind them they they are able to write in a very convincing way, just by superficially, you know, touching on a little bit. Um, but as soon as you begin to look at the actual evidence in context, because a lot of people will, will cherry pick the evidence that they, that they use, but you have to look at it in the broader uh, horizon and see where the pieces kind of fit together. As soon as you begin to do that, they just fall apart. You know, whether it's about JP Morgan pressuring uh, Harlan and Wolf to build the ships cheap, or whether it's about uh, coal bunker fires and speeding the ship up to, or whether it's about the ships being switched and Titanic, you know, continuing Olympics career and Olympic being sunk for the insurance money, whatever it is, as soon as you dig into the details, they just fall apart. I wanted to point out an, an example of that in the Lusitania world was Colin Simpson, and he can't seem to make up his mind, okay, First, they're trying to sneak ammunition into Great Britain on the sign. No one knows about it, even though it was actually on the amended manifest filed with the New York Port Authority. But they're trying to sneak the ammunition in. But somehow, they want the ship with this desperately needed ammunition. They want it to get sunk by a U-boat? Huh? That's what, what? I mean, yeah. Crazy. Yeah, well, yeah. That's, that's one of the points that Bailey and Ryan made when they said when they when they pretty much demolished it and said they were basically saying dude make up your mind which is it don't even get me started on that book <laughs> I, I, i've seen it it's trash i have it yeah. i don't know why but people get like a good conspiracy you know 12 year old benedict from the philippines he was just heartbroken because someone had put out something about the switch theory on one of those channels that the kids like nowadays TikTok and it just was liked and shared and believed and he was getting harassed at school, you know, for believing in Titanic. And, you know, it was really heartbreaking because 
for some reason. That switch theory is ridiculous. Absolutely. Well, you, some of us were dealing with Jonathan Prudeau a couple of years ago, and he was the one who's oh. Jonathan Prudeau, he 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 was the fine he was advocating this like he was a great investigator and these are my findings and all that. And it's just, he wasn't anything of the kind and you just couldn't reason with him. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like yeah. a crazy I'm sure some of you remember him. Well, so if anyone has any questions about any books, just bring it up in the book club and we will help you out. <laughs> Unless the author joins, that makes it a little tricky. <laughs> but I think we've been good at navigating. I can get awkward quickly. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. Good night. Thank Hi. you. Hey, Kent, can you Thanks hang for on joining for us. a couple minutes? Kent, can you hang yeah. on for a couple minutes? Will do, Bill. Bye, everybody. Good night, guys. Bye, Mary. And Thank you. Hi, and thank you. Take care. Cyril and David. Thank you. Hi, David. Thank you for your help. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. Nice to meet you, Michael. You too. Take care. Have a great Later. night. Bye, Jasmine. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bye, Terry. Bye, bye, Kent. Thank you again. Very nice to meet you. Bye. Oh, nice to meet you. Thanks for your questions. Oh, you. Thanks for answering. Answering.